Welcome everyone to the last webinar in our series of dairy webinars. We appreciate everybody coming out today. So I want to welcome Jen Miller who and Sarah Flack, uh, both folks I'm sure many of you know. Jen works with NOFA Vermont and has been providing technical assistance amongst many other things at NOFA uh, for how many years now, Jen? It's It's been a while. It's been, yeah, we're at like five and a half at NOFA. So, um, and Jen has kind of carried on the cost of production on organic dairy farms study that was started, you know, two decades ago almost by Bob Parsons and uh and has gone through lots of iterations but jen has sort of carried that on and that is great and i know people have really appreciated that <clears throat> and um and jen is joined by sarah flack who i know many of you know as well with um sarah flack consulting service and she also is a, a farm owner these days which is really exciting so i'm sure she's also um, very much thinking about that for this coming year and um, Sarah has been leading our organic grass fed cost of production work um, here at UVM and collaborating very closely with Jen as well, so that we are both using the same data collection forms and templates and strategies so we can actually start comparing all this data. So it's been really great to team up on these projects over the last couple of years now. Um, and hopefully that will continue into the future. And just quickly want to thank our sponsors today of our workshops. Um, we have SARE and Northeast Risk Management and the USDA, many folks um, providing us and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture funding to, to do these webinars and to do all this great work so that we can share it with you. Um, and I believe with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, Jen, yes. Jen, Jen's going first. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Heather. It's great to be here with you all. Um, so we're going to do a little, we're going to be going back and forth. So we, hopefully you won't get sick of either my voice or Sarah's voice as we go, go through this information. Um, I'm just going to start off with an overview of what uh, the organic, so this is all grain fed, grain feeding organic farms, um, what our cost of production project was looking like. And then Sarah will give you a quick um, view of hers just to kind of set the stage before we dive into numbers and results. Um, so as Heather said, this is an ongoing project that NOFA picked up after Bob Parsons pa passed away. So our first data collection year was in 2017. We used Bob's method that year. And then in 2018, we converted, um, Larry Trannel came over, trained Sarah and I and Heather's team um, on dairy trans, and we switched over to using that um, approach. Sarah and I have been working closely um, ever since to both make some improvements with Larry to dairy trans, and then also develop like a farmer specific results page that we're able to work through with people. Um, and integrate it into the business planning process. So on the NOFA farms, ever, again, everyone is certified organic dairy. Everyone, all the farms are in Vermont. 25 to 30 farms are participating every year. And the project is really primarily focused on cost and other production methods, metrics, um, sorry, like labor efficiency, acreage. Um, and we'll, we'll be digging into a bunch of those metrics along with cost of production. And then we're able, again, with that, especially with that farmer specific results template to focus in on profitability analysis, um, primarily on the individual farm level. So just to give you an idea of who um, participated in 2019 and 2020, and we're gonna focus on those two years um, we, because it was when we kind of, again, made those improvements on the dairy trans spreadsheets. And so they're the most, everything is aligned, everything's comparable, and there's a lot more detail in 2019, 2020 than there was in the 2018 data. Um, so of the farms participating, we had 60%, this is kind of the milk buyer breakdown. It's relatively representative of what happens in Vermont, maybe slightly skewed towards a higher percentage of Stonyfield. 
than in the state of Vermont. Um, the herd size, you can see the average of 78 cows, again, right in line with our VOF statistics, but the range is pretty large, which is important to consider as we're working through these numbers. So herd size of 24, all the way up to 185 cows. Um, folks have been certified for quite a while. Um, average acres per farm, and this will come back around, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but um, we're looking at about 3.8 acres per cow, but again, a pretty wide range of folks, you know, primarily doing purchase feed and having 0.7 acres per cow all the way up to almost eight acres per cow available. Um, there's also, you know, farms in that participated had a diverse array of milking setups. So it was, you know, mix of pipelines and parlors, tie stalls, free stalls. Um, we did have three farms that um, have robots. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah, who can give you a sense of their project. Great, thank you. So as Heather said, the this grass-fed cost of reduction is just a small part of the larger grass-fed research project that um, has been going on with her um, her team for the last well now more than more than five years, I think. Um, and so again, we also collected data using Dairy Trans. Uh, collaborating with Jen, and we've got data from grass-fed farms, an average of 22 farms per year that were 100% grass-fed and certified grass-fed. And the data was collected in 2018, 2019, and 2020. But again, we'll be focusing primarily on the 2019 and 2020 data uh, today. And we also focused really on cost of production, not so much on some of the other um, measures and we collected a lot of that production information so we could really dig into looking at what was most impacting cost. The farms for our study group is a slightly larger geographic range than the organic group. There's farms, uh, most of the farms are in Vermont and New York, but there's also some farms in New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, but all of them are in the Northeast region. We'll do the next slide, Jen. So looking at the grass-fed farms group again, uh, within this group, 50% of them were shipping milk to Organic Valley, 47% shipping milk to Maple Hill Creamery, and then with 3% of the farms were selling to other direct markets. We did not include any micro dairies that were making value added or direct marketing themselves. We stuck with the somewhat larger small uh, uh, farm size that were shipping milk to actual milk buyers. The average herd size, a little smaller than the organic farms at 63 cows, but again, there's this very broad range from 23 cows to over 200 cows on the farms that are grass-fed. The farms, we tried to select farms that were experienced grass-fed producers, so had been grass-fed for a number of years. So the average number of years that they'd been certified grass-fed was 5.4. And the majority of those farms had been certified organic for significantly longer than that. When we looked at the acres on the grass-fed farms, they have quite a lot more acreage per cow, came up to 5.7 acres per cow. And the way this is calculated is we collected the total acreage of all of the cropland and the hayland and the pastures. And then that's divided by the total number of mature cows. And that's done consistently between the grass-fed and the organic groups. So certainly looking at more acres per cow in the grass-fed group. But again, this really broad range from 1.7 to over 11 acres per cow. Some of the farms in the grass-fed group were purchasing in a significant portion of their forages. And we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, others were were actually making all of their own forages, selling some, and some were also making some bedding. Also a pretty diverse array of management systems and housing systems, but when we looked back at the farm list, there are over 60% of them um, are milking in parlors. Uh, next slide. So just taking a quick look at the differences in the standards between the grass-fed certified and the organic certified farms. So the grass-fed is an add-on certification on top of the organic certification. So all of them are certified organic. The grass-fed then have this additional set of standards. So the regular organic farms, they're feeding grain to their cows. 
but the grass fed farms cannot feed any grain at all, including grain byproducts. They also can't feed grain to their young stock. So when farms go grass fed, they often have to get a different mineral mix to make sure that there's no mineral byproducts or grain byproducts in the mineral mixes. The organic farms need to get an, a minimum of 30% dry matter intake from pasture averaged over the grazing season. And that grazing season needs to be at least 120 days long. Whereas for the grass fed farm, it's a higher standard. They need to hit 60% dry matter intake averaged over that grazing season and the grazing season needs to be 150 days minimum. The grass fed farms in the study generally are averaging over 80% and most of them are over 180 days in length of the grazing season. So that's just a little bit on the, the standards. Um, next slide. Okay, so now we're going to dive into some of the side by side number comparisons. And so some of this is a little bit of a review of the numbers we just went through, but here you can see it's side by side. So you can see the, the organic farms, 79 cows on average, grass fed are 63. Both groups have reported primarily having crossbreds, though there's certainly some farms within both groups that have purebred jerseys or Holsteins or other breeds. Fat content was pretty similar, ever so slightly uh, higher butter fat content on the grass fed farms, but fat sold per cow per year is higher in the organic farms. And if you look at the next line, that makes sense because the organic farms, the cows are producing more milk at 15,474 pounds produced. Um, well, that's actually not produced, it's sold. Um, that's the pounds sold on the organic farms. And then the grass-fed farms are selling 8,562 pounds per cow. The next two lines give you the information in hundredweights sold off the farm. The first line is the actual hundredweights sold off the farm. So again, the organic farms are selling more hundredweights per year off, their far off the farm than the grass-fed. And then the line under that hundredweight equivalents, we'll go into that in detail in the next slide, but that's the milk converted adding in some of the non-milk non income. Acres, again here, um, acres per cow at 3.8 on the organic and 5.6, almost 5.7 on the grass-fed per cow. So now we also are looking at the total cost per farm, which you can see is 459,000 on the organic and 252,000 on the grass-fed. That's the total cost of production on the, on the farm. Then the next line is cost per cow, which you can see on the organic is still higher than the grass fed at $5,919 per cow. The grass fed 4,177 being slightly lower on that per cow basis. But then once we start to look at it on a per hundredweight equivalent basis, you can see that the cost of production for the grass fed is then significantly higher than the organic. The organic coming in at $37.26 a hundredweight equivalent and the grass fed at $44.55 a hundredweight equivalent. I think you got the next slide, Jen. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna spend a just a little bit kind of digging into how we got to that. Just started with the big, the big punch and here's how we got there. And now we're gonna go into some more detail um, about different components of what's driving these differences. Um, so important thing Sarah just mentioned is that this cost is calculated per hundred weight equivalents. And so to get there, you're at you're taking total hundred weights sold, adding all other dairy related income. So whatever, calves, hay, ag program payments, and dividing by, that by the milk price. So that's no, basically, allowing us to look at cost of production with all revenue generated by the dairy enterprise factored in, um, which is you know, obviously rational if you're not gonna try to split out like how much it costs to produce the hay that you might've sold in that given season or something um, and take away those expenses and that income. So you can see here that again, the, the milk per cow produced, you know, not quite double, but almost double of grass fed the interesting, and then we have total milk sold in hundred weights, just straight, and then hundred weight equivalent. So, um, just noting that the organic farms added about you know one thousand one hundred twenty-one 
um, the difference between 100 weights and 100 weight equivalents is 1,121, and the difference on the grass fed size 876 or 67, sorry. And just noting that because it's another example of like the total um, production number being high, which is going to impact then how we're getting down to cash costs per 100 weight and total costs per 100 weight. Um, okay, so we've got our 100 weight equivalents. Um, one note that's really important to, to call out again, if you haven't been put through Dairy Trans Fund by either Sarah or myself, is that the total cash expense in the Dairy Trans version does not include any interest payments. And we'll get down to what's, what's being done in lieu of that, but that's just important to remember. So that cash cost per hundred weight is just does not include it. Um, so we're starting with our 100 weight equivalents. We've got our total cash expense per farm, total cash expense per 100 weight equivalent. Interestingly enough, very close on organic and grass fed farms at 2644 and 2632. From there, we'll talk about that more later too. Um, from there, we're going to into balance sheet adjustments. So in there, we're factoring in the income change, which is the sum of uh, changes in accounts receivable inventory of feed, supplies, livestock. Um, then we're factoring in the expense change to offset that, right? So sum of prepaid expenses, accounts payable, um, changes in fair market value and the depreciation of equipment, infrastructure, and land. And obviously embedded in that is the difference between capital purchases minus capital sales. So all of that's going into a balance sheet adjustment. We're then adding an equity charge. Um, so this is looking at all of their assets on their balance sheet. Um, so we're looking at cows, machinery, equipment, and land. We're then taking four, charging that 4% is gonna be charged to that total. And that's done across the board. So it standardizes the cost of using the assets in that farm system across all the farms instead of having various impacts of interest payments where like some farms have no debt. Some farms are, you know, they're five years in business. so they have a lot of debt. So we're trying to equalize that by using this 4% charge to their assets. And that is then the stand-in for that interest expense in this analysis. Um, at, after that, we're adding an unpaid labor cost. So basically this is the opportunity cost of unpaid labor and management. So um, <clears throat> taking the owner or owners, figuring out how many hours they worked, figuring out how many FTEs that is, which it, we use 3000 hours of labor per year to figure that out. And then charging that at a value of $40,000. So the opportunity cost of them working on the farm, even if you're not getting paid that much is factored in to try to get to like, okay, if we could actually, farmers could take that draw out, what would their total cost of production be? And so that's where we're getting down to a total cost per farm and that total cost per 100 weight equivalent, which Sarah reviewed. So, digging in even deeper here. Um, so we have, we're, we're gonna go through a series of slides to set the stage, um, organic and grass fed kind of side by side to just kind of look at the differences and inviting Sarah to just interrupt me whenever she feels like she has a fun fact to share with us as well. Um, so looking at this cost calculated per 100 weight equivalent, we just wanted to like isolate these numbers because this is really driving a lot of, again, those differences. You know, there's higher expenses on like total expenses on average for the organic farms, but because they're producing more milk in total and more 100 weight equivalent in total, we're getting to this almost equivalent total cash expense per 100 weight. And then their higher expenses is able to get divided out over more hundred weight so that their cost of production is lower. Um, <clears throat> we also are looking at this, we just keep it on your toes, we changed the view here. So it is no, <laughs> we're no longer looking at the straight up average. That column is this first, I'm gonna point to the screen like you can see it. Um, this is the first column here. Um, these are the straight averages. Then what we did is kind of, is divide them up into tertiles. So this is, lowest cost per 100 weight, medium cost per 100 weight, highest cost per 100 weight in roughly equivalent groups. 
um, across organic and grass-fed farms. So we're just looking at how each of these performance groups compares both against the averages and against themselves. So as you can see here, that our lowest cost group is producing you know, over 18,000 hundred weights a year, more than, well, little, almost double what the medium cost group is and more than double what the high cost group is. So again, it, that trend holds with the hundred equivalent and the milk per cow significantly different in the lowest cost per hundred weight. I'll also note on this side of things, um, our low cost group was primarily, I think there was one farm that was not Holstein based. They were all Holsteins um, or some Holstein crosses in their herds. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about the grass yeah. And we can see your cursor. It's really helpful. Actually. Perfect. Yeah, I was hoping <laughs> that was the case. <laughs> I don't think they can see mine though. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Similarly, with the grass-fed group, the first column is the average, and then there's the low cost, medium cost, and high cost. And again, you just really see this range where if, if we're calculating the cost of production per hundredweight equivalent, that middle row in there, the total milk sold hundredweight equivalents, on average is 6,185, but the low cost group it's 8,896, and then the highest cost of production group, 3,894. So, uh, you know, uh, not it, it's a lot of these numbers are coming in at 50% or slightly less than that than the organic group. So it really is a lot less milk to average these costs out over. We might say that like 10 more times during yeah. this. But. I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Again, looking at these numbers, these total, these final results before we start breaking down more of these components of um, expenses per hundred weight equivalents. The organic group, <clears throat> you know, the average here, 459,000 and change. The low cost group, definitely by far the highest expenses per farm on a dollar basis um, at 659,000, all the way up down to the highest cost groups. Um, we have another chart later, just remembering these numbers, the herd size is, you know, in line with this kind of drop in, in expenses. Um, dollars per cow, roughly, roughly equivalent. Um, but again, here we come down to total expenses per hundred weight equivalent. The lowest cost group is coming in at 32.43 on average. Oops, sorry. Um, the medium, the middle group is coming in at 35.89 on average and third, the highest cost is all the way up at 42.77. And those of you who understand milk prices and know milk prices know that this is a little, a little bit of a problem here. Um, and this again, running through here, we have this higher um, hundred weight equivalent produced being offsetting this, you know, the much more significant low cost, or I mean, high cost of total expenses. And there's a similar pattern down here in the grass fed. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Sarah, but it's, you know, we're coming in, the lowest cost is $34.48. The medium cost jumps up to $45 and the highest cost is $60.57 per hundred weight equivalent produced. Yeah, and the other thing that's similar is that the, the on a per farm basis, that low cost group, they, they do have the highest cost of production. And so when we, look at the number of cows um, on the farm, that'll start to make more sense. But yeah, just this huge range. Yeah, and just interesting to note too that the high cost organic group has more than, or sorry, the low cost organic group has more than twice the milk per cow of both the high cost organic group and the low cost grass fed group. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so looking at, so backing up to this, that equation that we were looking at. So we we're going to just isolating these total cash expenses per farm. Cause we thought it was pretty interesting that grass fed and organic come in very close to each other. Um, and you're not seeing the, the, the split in the difference until we layer in these, those other, um, variables. So we've got, I think we'll focus in on, you know, our dollars per cow and dollars per hundred weight equivalent, but Again, like dollars per cow, like 
it's you know seven hundred dollars more in that in those lower cost groups, um, and we'll break into why I th or think we know the reason why um, in a later slide. But they're about seven hundred dollars more than the medium cost um, and and the high cost groups for organic. Um, total cash expense per hundred weight is the lowest on the low cost farm, so twenty five dollars per hundred weight equivalent up to the medium at 26.64 and the high cost at 27.49. Um, and I'll turn it over to Sarah to, to just walk us through this grass-fed cash expense. Yeah, so I think the biggest difference between the grass-fed and the organic is there's a much larger range in the cash expense per hundred weight equivalent between the low group and the high cost group. So our low cost group was uh, 21.49 in cash expense per hundred weight equivalent up to 26.57 for the medium cost group, but then all the way up to 33.82 for cash expenses per hundred weight equivalent. And so I think that's the main thing to emphasize there. And I think we could just go right onto the next slide and look at the details on some of these cash expenses. So this is looking at the differences in the top five cash expenses of the organic and the grass fed. So on the bar chart, the blue lines are the organic expenses as a percentage of total cash expense. And just reminding you again that interest is not included in the cash expenses as they're calculated in dairy trans. So it's really cash expenses not including interest. So these are the, the top five expenses in blue for organic and in orange for the grass fed. So for both groups, purchased feed is the top cash expense as a percent of their total expenses. But you can see for the organic group, it's 41% of their total cash expenses. Whereas for the grass fed group, it's only 15.2% of their total cash expenses. Some of the other expenses are a little bit closer. Um, hired labor comes up in the top five for both of them at 10% for the organic and just under 9% for the grass fed. Repairs in the top five for both at 7% for organic and 11 for the grass fed. And supplies is in for both at 9.9% .9 for the grass fed and 6% for the organic. And then where we start to see the difference is that for the organic, custom hire is one of the expenses that lands in the top five cash expenses at 5% of the total cash expenses. Custom hire doesn't appear in the top five for the grass fed. Instead, it's rental of land that shows up in there, which if you think back to the fact that we've got more acres on these grass fed farms and more acres per cow on the grass fed farms lines up with what we're seeing there. Next slide. Oh, I think too, Sarah, just noting that like, I think that seed and fertilizer difference is very interesting um, without the grain bringing in inputs into, onto the grass fed farms, the level of investment is a lot more significant. That's true, yeah, it doesn't show up in the top five, but it's certainly a big difference. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so digging a little bit more, um, to feed costs. So we wanted to break out, so obviously, again, the highest as a percentage of total cash expenses for both groups was feed. Um, the average for organic was 41.5%. Um, and here again, we're gonna look at it split out into this low cost of production, medium cost of production, high cost of production. So the lowest cost group spent 36% um, of their expenses were on feed, medium cost, 47 and high cost 43. Um, I think important to remember that these are percentages. So they are spending, you know, the, the amount that they're spending is factored into a larger cash expense, um, average cash expense per farm in the low cost group, which is could be affecting how much of their budget is allocated towards grain. Um, <clears throat> I think one interesting thing is that um, the medium cost group has a higher percentage of expense dedicated to purchase feed. Um, if you look down, the grain and energy is basically equivalent to the high cost group, um, but the purchase forage is significantly higher. Um, not sure if this is an intentional, you know, 
strategy to try to limit acreage and be more profitable. Not sure if it was just due to drought conditions in 2020, driving up purchase forages. Um, so stay tuned on that to see if this continues to play out. But it was just an interesting trend to note. Um, the other thing is that like as a percentage of their budget, the low cost farms are buying the same, you know, 10% is purchased forage as the high cost group. Um, so I think that the other take home message was that um, the low cost group, the herd size, if you can, it's the last, oh, where's my little, little arrow here, um, 111 cows on average, so more than double the high cost group herd size. But if we think back to the previous, we're looking at the numbers, we didn't actually show you the acres per cow average across these groups is just about equal. So it's just another interesting, like they're not slamming necessarily, necessarily slamming more cows onto the same amount of land. There. Uh, all right, so looking at the same information for the grass-fed farms, uh, there is on, a, on average, the feed costs uh, as a percentage of their overall cash expenses was much lower overall for the grass-fed farms. But there's some real significant differences. The biggest being these grass-fed farms are not buying any grain. So this middle line that says purchase grain and energy, that is for the grass-fed farm, that's only going to be purchasing energy sources. And so for most of the farms, that is molasses specifically. So on average, you can see that the purchase forages makes up most of the feed costs at 10.8% but they're also spending 2.2% of that on some sort of purchased energy, mostly molasses, and then also minerals at 2.2%. So this is another big management difference between the grass-fed and the organic, since the organic farms are able to supply the majority of the minerals to their herds in the grain, which is a really convenient, easy way to do it. The grass-fed farms have to come up with strategies to get the cows to eat enough minerals to meet their mineral intake needs, without having it be in the grain. And so, and they have to buy different types of minerals that don't have grain byproducts in them. So for some farms, it is a good, um, it is a significant expense. So then looking at the low cost, medium cost and high cost groups. One of the things I think that was most interesting here was looking at the, the purchase forage as a percent of the, the total cash expense is at 15% for purchase forages in the low cost group. And in the high cost group is much lower at only 5.7%. And we'll talk about that in another couple of slides. One of the other really interesting differences was in this energy purchases in the molasses purchasing, the low cost and the medium cost was only, they were only spending 1% or 0.6% of their cash expenses on purchased energy whereas the high cost group was spending 6.1% of their total cash expenses on energy purchases. Mineral purchases as a percent of feed costs was the highest in the low cost groups. Um, and in some ways that might make sense because mineral deficiencies can be a really significant challenge for the all grass fed herd. And so the low cost groups may have, maybe they've tuned in their mineral, mineral feeding program. Then some of the other numbers that are in here, you can look at the total milk sold, um, hundredweight equivalents per year. So you can see that at 8,896, a lot more milk is sold per farm in the low cost group compared to the, the high cost group at 3,894 hundredweight equivalents sold. Big range in herd size here with 80 cows on average in the low cost group, 52 cows in the medium group, and then slightly less of 48 cows in the highest cost group. And then the cash expense total for the farm is highest in that low cost group and is actually lowest in the medium cost group and slightly higher in the high cost group. So now looking more at this interesting question on energy supplementation for the grass-fed farms. We did try to dig into the data a little bit in the grass-fed data with a lot of help from Sarah Ziegler at UVM to try to look at uh, what 
correlated, what management practices correlated with either higher cost of production or lower cost of production. 22, cow, uh, 22 farms is a somewhat small sample size to do a lot of statistics with, but we were able to see that the farms that were buying and feeding molasses regularly had a significantly higher cost of production. It was actually $10.04 higher on average, their cost of production compared to farms not buying and feeding in molasses or other energy sources. We also looked to see if those farms feeding molasses, maybe they were making more milk, um, but the data didn't support that. The farms that were buying and feeding molasses were not uh, selling any more milk than the farms not feeding it. Go on to the next slide. So another area with the grass fed data that we dug into a little bit was looking at forage purchases and acreage. So what we did see was that for um, as the number of acres per cow increased, the cost of production increases. The other thing we looked at was that farms purchasing forage instead of making all of their own forages had a higher cost of production. I'm actually going to say that again. Um, so farms that were buying in a significant portion of their forages had um, a lower cost of production than the farms that were making all of their own forages. And then digging into that a little bit more, what we saw on the farms who were buying in more of their forages is that they spent less on supplies, they spent less on fuel, and less on repairs. So those are all expenses that line up with driving your equipment around over larger acreages to make feed. We also saw that the farms that were buying in a significant amount of their forages had a higher labor earnings per hour, higher by $6.69 a um, hundred weight. So we can go on to the next slide. Okay, so one observation, which I will just be fully transparent, was not run through a statistical machine, um, but just in my, my brain statistical machine, um, I observed this. And so I'll just make the statement, but we can't like necessarily say there's true correlation here. Um, looking at the custom hire, which is again, that was the number five uh, expense in the top five expenses expense categories for organic farms. So the farms that were in the lower, the lowest COP group had the highest custom higher expenses per hundredweight equivalent. And by what appears to be a pretty significant amount. Um, the majority of the farms in that group were using custom hire to a significant degree. Um, and the most common custom higher expenses were spreading and chopping and then hoof trimming was mentioned by a large amount. Obviously, most of the expenses are probably driven by spreading and chopping. So just an interesting note. But again, like potentially lines up with reduced repairs, reduced supplies. So like, well, you know, kind of have to explore that, but it was definitely a trend. All right, so we're gonna take a look really quickly at these this capital expenses and investments. So looking here, Organic versus grass fed again with the low, medium, high cost groups. Um, the there was this noticeable difference in the amount, the capital purchases minus sales um, of the low cost groups. They were generally um, spending forty five thousand three hundred thirty eight dollars. Um, you know, in the difference between purchases and sales, so they were investing that much money basically back into their farm. Um, on average over the course of those two years. <clears throat> the medium group was, you know, not, not half, but, you know, significantly less at $27,235. And the high cost group, not much going back in at $8,375. Um, trend is very similar, though not quite as dramatic um, in the grass-fed herd, where we're looking at 29,462 purchases greater than sales in the low cost group. 10,192 at medium cost. And then the high cost actually were able to put a little bit more back into their farm. Um, I don't know if there's a, a quite quite the reason for that for that, but you know, it's just interesting to see the low cost group, they're able to invest more heavily into their farm. Um, and also I wanted to note that like they're they're doing this, and that investment is being reflected in their full 
cost of production per hundred weight equivalent because it's increasing their asset value for the following year. So they're getting that 4% charge calculated on like these, you know, investments year after year after year. So they are like, that's being factored in, but yet they're still coming out with the lowest cost of production per hundred weight equivalent. Um, looking at this capital invested per cow, it's fairly, you know, fairly even across the the low and medium cost groups, um, both in the organic system and in the grass fed systems. Um, a little bit more of a dramatic difference in the grass fed, and then the high cost groups in both. Um, organic and grass are, are topping $15,000. Um, and so I think that just sim probably simply reflects like that the, well, at least in the organic, the herd size, no, in both systems, the herd size is smaller. So it's the investments being divided over fewer cows. Um, and they potentially just based on numbers and total expenses per hundred equivalent have less available to to invest. Um, all of this, I think, sets the stage for really looking at differences in labor efficiency as we're looking at how much each of these groups invest per cow and on a farm basis. So labor efficiency will be the last two slides that we make you look at tons and tons of numbers, and then we will open it up for questions. Um, so looking at labor efficiency on the two different uh, groups of farms, the way dairy trans works for labor efficiency is when we're doing the, the visits with the farmers, we actually calculate with them as best as possible how many hours they actually pay employees to work each year. So we really do tally up like how many hours a year does each worker uh, work and we add all of that up. And then we also tally up how many hours the farmer owner manager also works. So that is then the total number of hours spent on the farm each year. That's divided by 3000 hours, which then comes up with full-time equivalents, the FTEs. And so when we look at the FTEs, the full-time equivalents on the organic and the grass-fed farms, there's slightly more FTEs on the organic farms at 2.82 with 2.36 on the grass-fed farms. They also have slightly fewer cows. But when we look at it on uh, cows per full-time equivalent, which is one of the really quick ways to look at labor efficiency on farms, they're actually very similar at an average of 29 cows per FTE on the organic farms and 28 on the grass-fed farms. We start to see a difference when we look at milk sold per full-time equivalent worker with 4,407 sold per um, worker on the organic farm and 2,770 per FTE on the grass-fed farm. That also plays out in somewhat lower labor earnings per hour on the grass-fed than on the organic farms. And then just breaking out just the unpaid labor, there is somewhat a, a little bit more unpaid labor on the grass-fed farms overall. So now we get into more detail on the same information, looking at the organic on the top and the grass fed at the bottom, now broken out into our three groups again with the low cost, the medium cost and the high cost groups. And um, again, I would just, I would look at the amount of milk sold per full-time worker and the cows per full-time worker. Those are kind of the, the two quick numbers I look at in here. So as we look at on the organic up at the top, starting with 40 cows per FTE, that's getting much closer to kind of an industry standard of labor efficiency for a dairy. But then 28 cows um, per FTE on the medium and down to 22 on the higher cost of production farms. Jumping down to look at the grass fed farms, their low cost of production group is 33 cows per FTE. Medium is 26 and high cost is group is exactly the same as the organic at 22 cows per FTE. So then if we look at the milk sold per FTE in the organic group, it starts with the low cost group is uh, selling over 7,000 pounds per FTE. 
in the organic group, and then the medium and high cost groups in there, 3,800 and 3,300. So gradually dropping down the milk per worker. When we look in the grass-fed group, the lowest cost group shipping 3,732 hundredweights per FTE, dropping down lower in the medium cost group, and then our high cost group is 1,777 uh, hundredweights per FTE. So a big range there in, in labor efficiency. Anything you wanna to add to this, Jen? Um, just a note that a reminder really on the unpaid labor hours that those costs are accounted for in this analysis. So they are assigned a value, you know, again, prorated. So like a six, 6,399 labor hours is obviously much higher, but they, that, that is paid. So that's going to get, you know, they, that, that's probably two owners, um, or two folks working like almost full time each. And so that's probably this farm, the low cost farms on average probably have $80,000 of unpaid labor um, cost factored in there. So just remember that as we're seeing these high numbers, especially as they're, um, <clears throat> you know, I think they're subsidized unpaid labor owner hours to get down to their cost of production. We made it through. Um, so special thanks to all of the farmers that participated both um, with NOFA and with UVM, with the grass fed and the organic groups. Um, it's greatly appreciated um, having you share the information. Hopefully the visits are helpful and informative, um, but it's definitely valuable for the overall research. And thank you to the many funders and, um, and sponsors who helped out. And also thank you to Sarah Ziegler from UVM Extension and Bill Cavanaugh from Nova Vermont because both of them have been very critical in, in assisting making these projects happen with data collection analysis making. Yeah, it's, they've been great. So. so that's it. Time for questions. That's yeah. Al says it's time for questions. Um, should I stop sharing and then we can if people want to yeah video. yep okay. yeah so there there is a question and i i think it's a small enough group if people want to unmute themselves and ask um that's fine fine with me we have some time Um, Lisa is asking a good question in the chat. She's asking if a farm- She just unmuted. No, nope, oh, okay. she muted again. She muted again? <laughs> <laughs> no. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, I did ask that question. I, I was really interested in, in the presentation you'd given on the difference between grass-fed and organic. So my question is, if one was trying to decide between the two, um, since grass-fed is an add-on kind of a standard, would you recommend that the farm sort of start organic and ease in with that and then move to grass fed? Or would you suggest that if grass fed was the ultimate goal, just start farming that way and uh, move towards that? Um, well, I'll give my answer and then Jen can give hers. We'll see. Um, so, cause both Jen and I do work with farms in helping them figure out whether going grass fed is a good idea or not. Um, I would say the first place I would start to answer that question would be to look at the forage quality on the farm um, and probably the soil fertility too, but the forage quality will tell a story about the, the soils. Um, if the forage quality is excellent and you have the right genetics to start with that are well adapted to grass fed, and that's the model you're going for, I, I would certainly consider just doing that right away. Um, and, uh, you know, assuming you can get the grass fed premium and, you know, and it works for you. So you'd want to be doing some cash flow projections to look at it. Um, but if you're starting out on a farm and you're not sure about the forage quality and you're putting together cattle from a couple of different sources and not completely sure that they have the right genetics to perform well on a all forage diet, then I think the idea of starting with at least a small amount of grain in the ration is probably a, a safe bet. Yeah, 
Anything to add on that, Jen? You're nodding, so. I was agree. I was nodding because I was agreeing. Yeah. Yeah. There, covered that well. Can I add to the question? Would that be okay? Yeah, go uh, ahead. Sorry. Hi, this is Douglas. Hi, hi, Sarah. Um, so, just to add to Melissa's question, so you said if you would start with uh, you, the second of the options was basically starting with introducing grain, but then to um, eventually wean the, the 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 cattle off of the grain to ultimately get to fully grass fed. And how long would you say that normally takes if you're not getting cattle that is um, you know, uh, accustomed to it. So the, the grass fed transitions that I've watched farmers do, some of them have taken as long as seven years where they've really focused very hard on building their soil health, um, changing the plant species composition in their pastures and hay fields and really building up that large supply of highly digestible high energy forages. Um, before they started slowly reducing the amount of grain in the ration. So the, you know, and that one was very successful. It was seven years. Um, and I don't think they really started reducing the grain until several years in. Um, there's, there are also farms who have done this in 90 days. Um, it's not always a good idea. Um, <laughs> And um, some of the challenges of rapidly taking the grain out of the ration are that you, you will see some problems emerge immediately in that like milk production can drop significantly. But some of the problems of removing the grain from the ration on a herd where you don't have the right genetics and forage quality yet are reproductive issues. And so you won't necessarily immediately see problems. Maybe the cows will keep making a reasonable amount of milk, but if you're not monitoring things very quick, very closely, you can get in you know, a year into your transition and realize that your days in milk are slowly slipping out as cows don't breed back. And then that can be kind of this spiraling problem of lower milk production, cows not breeding back, and then you can end up um, really in a, a financial bind. Um, and so I guess my answer is somewhere in between um, and with lots of forage testing and lots of soil testing to see what the, what the forages look like um, so that you can build your ration around that. Super Thank interesting. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah and Jen. Uh, Jason, you have a question about custom hire. Maybe. Partially a question, partially a comment, but Jen or, or Sarah, I was wondering out of how many of those, because obviously we saw from the data that the lower cost of production came from farms that were using custom hire, but do you know how many of them are like a hybrid? Because we, I see a real problem in the hybrid in the trying to maintain a fleet of equipment, to do some of your own and then doing some custom hire ends up in still high costs and then also hiring people to do part of it. I didn't know if that was looked at at all. Not in like super depth, but like in looking across like our qualitative info, it's definitely a huge mix. Um, like even though farms, the low cost farms were still doing portions, you know, so they're bailing while they're hiring out the chopping or, you know, it's so there's a lot of them are hybrid. There's not too many that saw that were all custom hire. But you're right, that is a that is a juggle and it depends on farm size and the scale and yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's interesting. I'm I'm writing down some of these questions and comments because they keep coming up. Um, and I know in the grass fed work too and just trying to dig into it deeper like you're asking Jason. Um, I'm sure it's a case by case basis depending on the farm but um, yeah, it definitely seems like there's something really going on there that we should probably look at a little deeper. Um, Celine, did you want to ask your question? Kind of a comment, kind of a question? Uh, I mean, sure. Yeah, it's just super interesting. And it makes me wonder where all that molasses and money is going if it's not going into the milk. Like, do they have better overall body condition or yeah, it just seems like worth looking into if it's such a big cost difference. So just wondering if there's any plans to look into that or any other thoughts on where that money is going. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, when when that number came back, um, when Sarah Ziegler and I were working on that, I, at first I thought it was the wrong decimal point because um, the cost of production in the farms feeding molasses really was so much higher. Uh, yeah, I agree. We definitely need to look into this more. And you know, farms use molasses in very different ways. Some of them are using you know a teeny tiny amount of molasses in the minerals just to increase palatability, and we didn't include those farms in in that group. Um, the, then some farms use just a small amount of molasses on very specific cows, like a first calf heifer, where they're concerned about her losing too much body weight or something like that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the farms where we broke it out and looked at it separately were farms who were feeding it at least at certain times of the year um, on a regular ongoing basis. So, and it, it kind of lines up with some of the other research I've looked at on molasses, which Every time I look at it more, I feel less and less clear about <laughs> molasses and feel like we need more and more research to clarify when is it really useful in the ration. Yeah, it kind of makes me wonder too about <clears throat> really digging into the um, ration that people are feeding and the nutritional value of the ration with, with farms um, and whether or not they actually need it. And, and then looking at the difference that it makes or doesn't. Does that make sense? Because people may think they need it um, and they're feeding it for whatever reasons, but really in reality, maybe their forages are, are better than they think or acting in a different way. Um, so that, that would be something really interesting, I think. I agree, Celine. To, Can I add to another agree. comment to that? Yeah. Um, just also when Sarah had mentioned that we didn't see those farms have higher milk sales, again, it's just an emphasis on sales. That's the numbers that, right, we, we see um, income and expenses. We didn't measure milk production as a whole on the farms. So some of that molasses could be boosting milk production overall, but maybe that milk is not being sold. It's being fed to calves or, or being used elsewhere, right? So that we don't have that information for these farms either. Um, so just a caveat to that data to understand it a little bit better. We definitely need more info. I have more to add, but I'm going to go on to Abby. I see Abby has her, her hand up. So we'll, we'll go with that first. Abby. Hi, everybody. Thank you guys so much for all of this. Um, can you hear me? Okay. I think my internet's weird. Yeah, but, we can hear you. Um, I was just, you know me, I'm, I'm zooming out and I'm thinking, you know, is there, do you see a potential with this data to start to understand the kind of larger ramifications um, when we place this in a climate framework and think about the methods of agriculture that are regenerative and towards which we need to be heading and the fact that most of our farmers are older and was there a component in this data that, that you could tease out or potentially collect that could illustrate, this sounds so terrible, but what our next generation of farmers is up against to produce milk in these ways. In other words, with the labor efficiencies, et cetera, is there a correlation between the, um, the knowledge base and the number of years farming versus the uh, labor efficiency and or the, uh, the, the way the costs play out. Does that make any sense how I'm asking that? So you're asking if the older generation has higher in labor efficiency? Right, in other words, do we have the potential with this data to illustrate yet again what the next generation of farmers are up against and the, Im the importance of the resourcing capacitation and potentially the importance of apprenticeship programs, for example, or mentorship in how we're thinking about how we're uh, um, resourcing the next generation of farmers who are interested in producing milk in this fashion, if that makes sense. And it I'm just wondering- total sense to me. Does, I've heard yeah. okay. <laughs> I've heard Sarah Flack say this, and I'm going to get her off the hook so she's not saying it, but she's like, how in the world would any new potentially 
young or new farmer get into this industry? You know, the, yes, that's, the money. That's, that's and, exactly yeah. my point. <laughs> as a person who, I think Mackenzie's on the line too, and as a person who's working to try to train people as best as we can as apprentices to move on. I'm just wondering, you know, when you see these numbers, uh, yeah, that's what I'm left thinking is, yeah. <laughs> how on earth are we going to do this? And, I, I have know, a couple of thoughts on this, Abby. I love your questions, by the way. Um, one is that, you know, with both the organic and the grass fed, the, the more I look at that data, and then at the same time, I've been going around for the last month starting to collect 2021 cost of production data from farmers, and I'm seeing the input costs rising massively. You know, so the cost of grain in 2021 is significantly higher than it was in 2020. Fertilizer is higher. Uh, and so it's, it is a really good moment to do exactly what you're asking, which is like, how can we use this data to help farmers? Um, and I think a lot of it just keeps coming back to what Heather Darby keeps saying over and over and over, which is we need to focus on improving forage quality and productivity. And we need farms to have the training and the resources to grow larger amounts or buy larger amounts of, of high quality, high energy forages, whether feeding grain or not. Um, one of the other pieces of this is, um, is also that within the averages, the average cost of production, which you know may not look very encouraging when you just look at the average total cost of production, if you look at the high cost, the low cost, and the medium cost, those low cost farms um, really have a lot to teach all of us in terms of um, what are they doing so that their cost of production um, is working better for them. And, you know, and I think sometimes we can talk a lot about forages and grazing and things like that, but we really do need to constantly be, tie be tying it back to what is the actual cost outcome of these changes in management. Yeah, thank, thanks guys. That's really, that's really helpful. Yeah, I can add one not, again, not correlated statement, but I think I'm thinking about our low cost group was, if I took, if I think about the average age, it was not the oldest group at all. And so like, I think that there are leaders, most of the leaders in these um, efficiencies and improvements and like really thinking about things like forage quality and milk quality, like are tending to be on the lower end of the age spectrum. Um, compared to the high cost group, there's a lot of older, older generation in tie stalls that are, you know, that are need, it's not, it's not working what worked 10 years ago isn't working right now. Well, that's great. Thank you. That's like, that's super encouraging. I love that. So that's, that's, thank you guys so much for collecting this data. I just think it's, it's so necessary. It's really hard to find good data like this. And I, I think we're in a moment where it's just it's so important to have it. Really appreciate all of your hard work in getting it. Um, I'm looking in the chat here. I, you know, I think um, just to add to that, Abby and others, you know, that have been involved in these conversations around environment and climate change and payment for ecosystem services. I think, you know, something that continue, continually sort of shocks me <clears throat> just being a part of these projects is, you know, the costs. And I want to say true costs, and I, I'm not even sure if we do end up capturing all the true, true costs of farming, even with this. And just the, the, you know, hard fact to swallow is that, you know, we're not paying people enough to produce milk in a way um, and in an environment that everyone says they want. And that's the piece that just kind of blows my mind. Like, no matter what meeting you're at, you know, the conversation is centered around everybody grazing and everyone growing grass. But the hard reality is that nobody's paying for that. 
And so what is really the incentive for farmers or, you know, anyone to, to do it? Um, that's, you know, where these conversations around paying for those benefits in some ways become more important because it's not coming, you know, when somebody goes to buy a gallon of milk. And, and maybe I shouldn't say that when farmers are selling the milk off their farm. It doesn't mean that the price that's being paid in the store isn't enough. It's just how much goes back, you know, to the farmers themselves. So <clears throat> I'll get off that one. And uh, let's see here. We got, <laughs> thanks, Abby. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this isn't a, I don't know, that forum, but man, I just keep hearing this, you know, it's all around me. Wow. If farmers did this, they'd be making money. You know, if farmers were just doing this and, you know, they graze, they would be uh, much better off. But I, you know, I'm not, I don't see that necessarily in this, in these numbers. So on the generational point, um, some farms do farmers and residents on their farms that might help contribute to knowledge sharing and exchange. I don't know, um, Melissa, if you want to add to that at all. Sorry, I just read your comment. I should have let you pipe back in. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. I was just, I was really interested in, in what the last um, attendee asked. And I was just saying, I know of examples where some farms use these farmer and residence programs. In some ways, it's a way of letting maybe somebody who can't actually afford the cost of land or the farm itself sort of practice farming. But in another way, um, I think it could be an avenue that sort of helps with that knowledge sharing or exchange where there might be a younger generation that's interested in sort of doing farming another way, but is also benefiting from the wealth of knowledge that's there in the farm with the older generation. And there can be sort of a, an environment where that exchange uh, coexists. So it's just an interesting point to add. Thank you. We appreciate that. <clears throat> um, are there, I mean, we could, some of us I know could talk about this all day long, <laughs> but uh, it is, 1240 and um, I can, I can yeah. jump in if that's okay. Um, so Melissa and I are working on a project. We've actually had the opportunity of chatting with Sarah in the past. Um, and I, I, I hear, uh, you know, the, the frustration in, in your voice and most, you know, in a lot of people's voices on that and saying, well, where is the demand for it? How are we going to actually get around to, you know, drumming up the type of demand and interest in that grass fed product and i mean isn't part of it come my backgrounds in marketing and sales and you know cpg stuff and um it's a i, I it seems to me that the way is to, is a bit of a re-education of you know the consumer and you know it's really going to the market and trying to you know uh, really just kind of you know scream from the rooftops as to what that why why it's why it why it, why it is worth what it's worth um, and, and this is a thing that I just don't understand. We've, we've all been basically conditioned to understand added value dairy products, especially the likes of butter or milk or something like that as commodity level stuff. Whereas in fact, it's not, if you really look at it, it, it shouldn't be if it's done properly. So as part of that is the onus on, when I say us, I'm using that quite liberally, but it seems that people need to start understanding that to get the good quality stuff that I know the likes of us, you know, that I love, I'll go to the ends of the world to go and get, you know, a beautiful, uh, you know, 500 grams of, uh, you know, grass, pure grass fed butter or something like that. Is a part of it a reeducation? And in, in that case, where do we go to have those discussions? I mean, are there avenues that people are exploring to, to do that? Yeah, you know, I think um, the Dairy Business Innovation Center here in Ver in the Northeast, and they've set up several of these around the country, are trying to, you know, focus on more projects with marketing. You know, I know our marketing budget <clears throat> for ag in the state is pretty small, mm. very small. Um, and then, you know, the, the milk marketing board that people pay into, I'm not sure, you know, if I feel like we're also on the defense about farming. I feel like we spend more time trying to defend what farmers do than really trying to promote what they do. Does that make sense? Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, public perception and public perception in the marketplace, you know, can be really, really big drivers. <clears throat> I don't disagree with that. And I think 
probably a lot of that work would help on lots of levels for sure. Mm. Yep. We do have the majority of the people I feel like that live, um, you know, pay a lot of people living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and, and that's a, you know, at least in Vermont too, it's a pretty big concern here. Um, anyway, yeah, no, I, I, I feel it. And I want to, I want to try and use my skill set and my expertise to try and, you know, change those perceptions and, and trigger that type of demand. So, yeah, that's great. We need more people talking about the good things about farming mm -hmm. because there's, you know, we got to eat. So, um, now, and with that, we are in our lunch hour here. So <laughs> I definitely want to be mindful of that. I've been eating peanuts and I just, I choked on one before, like, I'm okay. Not that anybody was worried, but I was like supposed to be unmuting myself and getting to the next question. And I didn't know if I was going to make it, but it's all good. Um, any other questions from folks? Just want to say again how much we've appreciated everybody coming out. It's been <clears throat> nice, uh, I guess, you know, at least virtually. I will say we were all talking before this webinar about summer field days and getting really excited about um, getting people back out on farms and visiting folks and seeing each other. So you can um look forward to hopefully seeing people in person this summer at um some farm field days and up at the research farm i i guess i can't, i shouldn't say anything about the nodpa field days but be looking out for information on the northeast organic dairy producers association field days um that'll be a great one where uh, it that will be in person and somewhere maybe close to you Great. All right. Well, great job, Jen and Sarah Flack and Sarah Ziegler, who's like, she doesn't turn her camera on, but she should. So we can all thank her as well. And Bill, I don't know, Bill, is Bill on? But a big shout out to Bill too. I heard Bill was also working hard on this. So thank you. And um, we'll see you all this summer, I bet. <laughs>